Hello, my name is Professor Hannah Weiser. This is Introduction to Business, and today we will be discussing the legal environment of a business. Now, the legal environment of a business is a very complicated topic, so I encourage you to dive deeper into it in the business law course known as MGMT 201. That'll give you more detail about this intersect between the law and business that's just so important to the business field. So I hope you dive deeper. I do want to give you a foundation today so you know some of the general terms and know what to look out for. So our objectives for today will be to define and differentiate between the law, the legal system, and rule of law. We'll also distinguish the differences between statutory, common, and tort law. We'll explain the role of contracts in the business environment and the requirements of an enforceable contract. We'll also explain product liability, forms of what's called negligence, fraud, and the theories of recovery in a product liability claim. We'll define a warranty and differentiate between express and implied warranties. Finally, we'll distinguish between compensatory damages and punitive damages. So why does this matter? This helps us to understand contract agreements and prevent any disputes that may arise. Even if something isn't in writing, it could be a valid contract. Anytime you're making an agreement with a customer, a supplier, or an employee, it's really important that you understand those terms and that you make sure that the right terms are there. It helps to limit liability to the business, especially for customer claims, and really to navigate the legal system if your business does face a lawsuit, which can happen even if you're in the right. So let's define law and differentiate between law, the legal system, and rule of law. Black's Law Dictionary says the law is a body of rules of action or conduct prescribed by a controlling authority and that have a binding legal force, that which must be obeyed and followed by citizens subject to sanctions or legal consequence is a law. The idea here is that the law are rules, they're bare minimums we must follow. But the laws don't correct every wrong that occur in society. It's, it's not perfect. And that's something I want to make sure is clear. While it does allow for some predictability, the way our system works, you know, sometimes people go unpunished for doing the wrong thing. And other times people get punished when they did what was right. And so it's a very, very tough system. You have to be able to, and person is innocent. We call the cloak of innocence. They're innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in a criminal case or by a preponderance of the evidence that it's more likely or not than not in a civil case. And that's just hard to prove sometimes. You know, sometimes you don't have the evidence to prove something happened. And so sometimes someone can go free who was in the wrong. The idea behind our legal system with that is that hopefully, you know, they will eventually end up facing consequences for their bad conduct. That one person who behaves badly will likely repeat that behavior and end up facing their consequences. So some of the places that the laws derive from are the United States Constitution. This is the supreme law of the land. It's the overriding law. Even if a state law exists, if it conflicts with the Constitution, the constitutional law will stand. Statutes are laws created either at a federal level or at a state level by their governments. Again, those state statutes must not conflict with federal statutes. Another way we see the laws in what's known as the common law. These are earlier cases decided by the courts. So we can look to the highest courts and we can see what the outcome was in a similar case as a form of precedent. This idea goes to stare decisis, let the decision stand. While a judge can certainly make a different opinion by looking at prior cases, it gives some guidance as to the decision they may make. Now keep in mind another big part of the law that we don't really see on TV. Most legal cases actually settle Usually there's a way to find a happy medium that doesn't involve months, years in the courtroom, hefty attorney fees, and more. And that can be very tolling and a big time commitment as well as a financial one. So there's different numbers out there, but about 90% or the majority of cases generally will settle outside of court. If you do go to court, it's what's known as litigation. These are lawsuits. You know, a claim is filed in court and ultimately you go to trial. Alternative dispute resolution is another form that's used to resolve disputes other than litigation, which is either a formal or informal process that does not involve going to trial. Things like negotiating, mediating, and arbitrating a case.
Now our U.S. federal system is shown here. You know, you'll see there's a number of trial courts, and this is usually the stuff you see on TV. This is the fact-finding. Okay, so it's happening generally in the U.S. district courts, okay, of which there's 54. However, if it's something having to do with bankruptcy or tax, you might find yourself in one of the more specific, specialized, specific limited jurisdiction courts like the U.S. Tax Court or the U.S. Bankruptcy Court. If there was some sort of error at the trial, you know, maybe the judge gave the wrong instructions or there, you know, was an incorrect piece of evidence either put forth that should not have been or, or not put forth, you can appeal that case to the U.S. Court of Appeals or the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit Court, depending on which trial court you begin in. Ultimately, you can go to the United States Supreme Court as the highest court of appeals if you don't like the outcome of the lower appeals court. However, keep in mind, not all cases are heard at the U.S. Supreme Court level. The U.S. Supreme Court has nine justices that are appointed for life, and they can actually refuse to hear a case, and they create a final authority. So they may choose not to hear a case when a writ of certiorari is put forward asking the case to be heard. If a thousand cases are put forward, they maybe only hear 100 of them each year. And they're only going to choose the ones that are most significant that need this type of final authority to be heard. Now at a state level, you'll see a similar construct to what we see on the screen, very dependent on the state you're in. So you'll see that there's going to be that trial court level, there's appeal less levels where there's three judges, there won't be in a, jury, a jury in these cases. And at the state Supreme Court level, you'll see there's usually seven justices that can also refuse to hear a case and they serve as a final authority. So this will vary from state to state. For example, in Maryland, our highest court is the Maryland Court of Appeals, whereas in other states they'll call themselves the, the uh, New Jersey Supreme Court. Supreme State Supreme Court, okay, just as an example for you. So let's look at the differences between statutory, common, and tort law to give you a foundation of some of these different areas. Criminal law helps to maintain order in society. The idea here is to deter wrongdoing, and ultimately people face jail as a consequence and or fines. Civil law helps to, to settle disputes between private parties, and the resolution is usually money. There'll be a monetary outcome to those cases. If you look on the screen, you'll see some of the differences between civil law versus criminal, criminal law. For example, in civil law, a preponderance of the evidence is enough to prove that somebody is liable. We say liable instead of guilty. Whereas in criminal law, the burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. And generally, it'll be the government bringing the case. The government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that person is guilty, otherwise they're considered innocent. In the courtroom, that means proving to a jury that unanimously that that person is innocent. Okay, so that means all 12 people have to agree, and it's hard to get 12 people to agree on anything. So it can be very difficult to prove guilt in a criminal case. Now, I want to talk to you about that difference between criminal versus civil cases. O.J. Simpson, a former NFL player, was accused of murdering his ex-wife, Nicole, as well as her friend, Ronald. Do you think this would be criminal or civil law? If you said both, you're right. This is a criminal case. The government will bring charges against O.J. Simpson. And unfortunately, in this case, they were not able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was guilty, so he was found innocent on a criminal level and did not face jail time for this particular crime. On a civil level, the families of the victims also were able to bring a suit against O.J. Simpson on behalf of Nicole and on behalf of Ronald for this wrongful death. As a result, because the burden was lower, just a preponderance of the evidence, they were actually able to prove at a civil level that he was liable and they were received over $40 million for the victims. So you can see how you can have two different outcomes for the same problem, depending on if it's the criminal or civil suit. And you certainly can find yourself in the courtroom on a criminal level and then again as a, on a civil level. Tort law is different from criminal law. Tort means wrong. And generally it's a violation of a duty that's imposed by civil law. It's based on this obligation that you have. There's no agreement needed. The victim prosecutes and receives compensation or restitution. They try to make them whole. There'll be three types of these, which are intentional, negligence, and strict liability. 
Okay, you'll see some differences between these on the screen. Let me zoom in for you. So here we see some of the intentional torts, things like assault, battery, defamation, invasion of privacy, false imprisonment, or intentional infliction of emotional distress. You can also see against property, trespass, conversion, and again, also against some economic interests, some intentional torts. The funny thing is, while they're called intentional torts, you don't have to intend harm on someone. You just have to intend an act. So, for example, you unscrew the, the bottom of the, the, the legs on a chair, and you think it's so short that the person would just fall over, you know, and it, they wouldn't get hurt. But unfortunately, when they sit down, you know, they fall and their bones are so fragile, they get hurt very much. You didn't intend to hurt them, but your actions of unscrewing the, the bones of that chair caused harm to that individual. You will be responsible under an intentional tort. Here, it would be a battery. Another example, you love soccer. You kick a soccer ball. You never intend to hurt anyone with that soccer ball, but unfortunately, you have bad aim and you hit one of your friends out on the field with that soccer ball. You didn't intend to hurt them, but it's still an intentional tort. It could still be considered that battery. Going back to our three different types of torts, negligence is a duty, it's an obligation that is broken or breached, which causes harm to an individual. So for example, you have an obligation to drive safely, if you are drinking and driving, or you are playing on your phone, or doing your makeup and you're distracted while driving, you have an obligation to drive safely, you've broken that obligation, if harm is caused as a result, you could be negligent. Strict liability, our third category of torts, is when there doesn't matter if there's intent or not, if something bad happens, you will be responsible. With strict liability, this is something that really falls into a business issue because many businesses, they put forth a product, like General Motors puts forth a car, and they find that it's not working properly. It could cause harm or even death. As a result, they will be strictly liable if their car results in that type of harm, whether they intended it or not. They can be liable to the individuals that were harmed. The goal here is to try to make sure that businesses are making safer products and holding them accountable when they fail to do so. Our last area of the law that is very important to be familiar with is what's known as intellectual property law, which provides certain rights and protections for owners of the kind of property that results from the fruits of our mental labor. Now, it's not an idea. This is a big thing to remember. You can't protect an idea itself, but you can protect what it becomes. So with a copyright, you can protect a creative work. As soon as you create a book, as soon as you create a song, as soon as you draw something or, or even write a paper for class, it's copyrighted. Registering it with the Copyright Office is what allows you to note that it's registered and make someone liable who possibly infringes on that copyright, tries to use the work as their own and benefit from it on a monetary level. Trademarks are used to show the source of a good or service. A trademark could be the Nike Switch, Swish or the McDonald's Golden Arches. You know, this is how we identify that brand. And likewise, you might see that there's, there can be a trademark infringement case if someone's using that branding, using that trademark as their own for their benefit. Patents are granted by our United States Patent and Trademark Office and it permits the inventor exclusive use of an invention. There are a few types of patents, but there are utility patents, which help to really help with inventions, okay, the, the mechanics of it. There's design patents, which have to do more with things like the actual design of something like this phone. Oops, sorry, not on the screen here, design of this phone, okay, the curved edges, the button on the bottom can be protected. And then there's also plant patents that exist. Now the final type of copyright you should be familiar with is what's known as a trade secret, which is simply confidential information that allows a business to obtain an advantage over its competitors. For example, Coca-Cola, the soda, they've had one of the longest standing trade secrets in the exact formula to replicate their Coca-Cola soda. While businesses can make something that tastes similar, none can make the same because they lack that secret formula.
Now, contracts are a big part of business. Okay? They're legally enforceable. If one party fails to do what they're supposed to do, what they've promised to do, there can be what we call a breach of contract. It doesn't have to be in writing. All there needs to be are these four requirements you see on the screen. There has to be an agreement. There has to be some sort of meeting of the minds. An offer is made and accepted, and everyone understands what those obligations are. Consideration is the big reason that a promise becomes an enforceable promise under the law or a contract. There has to be something bargained for in exchange. In a business setting, this usually means some money is given for a product or a service. There's something monetary then being exchanged for something of value. That's generally what we mean by consideration. And that's what distinguishes a promise you might make to your friend to give them your car when you're done, you, when you're moving away and you're going somewhere with public transportation and you decide you don't need your car and you say, I'll give you my car. Okay, and then you decide not to. You won't find yourself in court unless there was consideration. If your friend is paying you for your vehicle, now it's gone beyond this gift, this nice thing to do. There's a bargain for exchange. It's become a contract. There's an agreement that's been broken. Capacity and legality are also important elements of a contract. You need to have capacity, meaning that you're able to understand what you're agreeing to. This can be impaired under the law by being under age 18. The law says that you don't have the capacity to really understand a contract until you're 18 or older, an adult. Also under the law, if there's any type of mental disability or an impairment to your ability to think through things properly, like you know being very, very, very drunk or under the influence of other drugs and alcohol, um, you certainly could lack the capacity to understand your agreement and therefore it could invalidate that contract. Also, contracts about things that are illegal, like drugs, the law is not going to help enforce that. You know, you get mad because you go to buy cocaine and it turns out that it's baking powder and you try to sue the person who sold it to you and you show up in court and say, hey, this person sold me baking powder instead of cocaine. You know, the law is not going to be excited about that. So they're not going to help you to break the law. So it needs to be a legal contract. You need to have capacity. There has to be a meeting of the minds about what you're agreeing to. Then there needs to be something of value being exchanged. That's what's required to form a contract. It doesn't have to be in writing. Okay, there are certain types of contracts that they do require to be in, in writing, like uh, property, your home. There should be an in writing contract. And even if they don't have to be in writing, I usually encourage it. Sometimes you just forget things, you know, so it's good to have all the terms in writing on paper. That way, if an issue arises later on, you all remember what you agreed to. For instance, I rent out some space to my sister. You know, and we obviously love each other very much, and I rent her this space for her business, and we have a lease, a form of a contract. And she provides me some money for the use of that space, and we have all the terms of our agreement there. We both have capacity. We're above 18. It's a legal subject matter. A renting space for her licensed business is absolutely okay to do. And the reason we put this in writing, you know, we're twins, we're very close. We know that we're not trying to screw each other over, but by having it in writing, it helps us remember things. You know, we forgot we have kind of a complicated setup about how the rent payment works. It's based on the number of clients she has. And we forgot exactly how we had set up that kind of prorated charge. Six months later, when it came into play, we were able to look back to what we agreed to and avoid a dispute. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about agency law. This is a big deal because it's when you're acting on behalf of someone, which is when you're an employee for an employer. This doctrine of respondeat superior applies, which means let the master answer for the servant's actions. It definitely applies to an employer-employee relationship. The idea here is that an employer could be responsible for their employee's actions, their negligence. Now, of course, the employee could be responsible for negligence as well, but often you'll find people going after the employers because they have deeper pockets. They have more money. So if you are an employee, if your employee is acting within the scope of employment, meaning that they're an employee, not an independent contractor, even if they're called an independent contractor, if they act more like an employee, the law could consider them an employee. So first of all, they have to actually be an employee. If they're an independent contractor, the employer will not be liable. But if they are an employee, and they're under the employer's control in terms of time, place, the purpose of the activity, 
In general, they'll call that within the scope of employment. Not only will the employee be responsible, the employer also could be responsible. So if you're hiring employees, keep that in mind. Now you could be responsible for the actions of people acting on your behalf as that creates an agency relationship. Now there are some recovery mechanisms here. In cases of product liability, there are really three grounds. Under negligence, again, if there's a duty of care that's breached and results in harm, even if it's unintentional, you could be responsible as a business for a broken product. Under strict liability, you could have face claims. Again, it doesn't require intent to harm or even negligence. If you design a faulty product, you could be responsible for any injuries that occur. For example, General Motors made a car where the engine, the ignition key was not working correctly. They chose not to resolve that and not to do a recall. There were deaths and injury as a result, and they were strictly liable for those injuries because they built a car that didn't work safely like it should have. Now, breach of warranty is another claim. This is a guarantee that a product meets certain standards of performance that's broken. Okay, so if a warranty is breached, you can also file a claim. Now under negligence, you must prove a business had a duty of care that was breached and caused harm, even if it's unintentional. There are three types of negligence. One is a failure to warn. You should warn the public of potential dangers. Design can also be a form of negligence. The product can be defective if the risk of harm is greater than the risk of usefulness. There's also negligence per se. If the product just doesn't meet certain legal standards, you can find yourself facing a claim. Now under strict liability, a business will be liable if there's evidence that a product is defective, that it did not alter, it was not altered in any way since it left the defendant's hands, and the use has to be foreseeable. Now, for example, if it's a chair, foreseeable doesn't just mean me sitting on that chair. It's possible that someone could use a chair to stand to reach something that's high up and difficult to reach as well. So it's not just the intended use, it's any possible likely use of that product. Okay. Again, this also involves actions that are inherently dangerous and for which a party can be liable, no matter how carefully they perform them. A breach of a warranty is a guarantee that a product meets certain standards of performance. Businesses provide warranties generally in a couple of ways. One is through an express warranty, where you affirm that a product meets certain quality standards you describe those standards, the performance, and the condition. And usually you'll see that. You know, a lot of businesses provide a one-year warranty, two-year warranty, and expressly describe what that entails. An implied warranty is a little different. This arises automatically out of a transaction. Okay, first, that it's merc the mercantility of that product, and secondly, the fitness for a particular use. Mercantility is which the product is reasonably fit for its ordinary use. It should work as it's reasonably, in reasonably intended to. And then for a particular purpose, it states that the product is fit for some type of specific use. So whether or not the company will expressly state that warranty, there can be this implied one. Now what do we do? Someone breaks a contract, they breach a contract, or we find ourselves facing a, a claim of negligence in a tort suit. There are a couple different types of damages, which are compensatory and punitive. Compensatory damages are generally provided to make a victim whole again. It's payment for the injury, okay, to a plaintiff who prevails in a civil suit. So any type of lost wages, any medical expenses, even any pain and suffering can be provided in terms of compensatory, compensatory damages as monetary relief. We want to try to provide the money to bring that victim a whole again as much as we can. Now keep in mind, if you find yourself in a situation where you, you lost your hand, you know, that's not something that we'll be able to replace under the law. You can't bring that hand back. So the money would have to be based on pain and suffering, medical expenses, and any lost earning potential. You know, if you're a famous musician and your hand gets injured, certainly that's going to be a bigger financial impact. So again, compensatory damages, how do we make that victim whole again? Any expenses that incurred were incurred, and then on top of that, any pain and suffering you experience as a result of that injury or that issue. Whereas punitive damages, they're intended to punish a guilty party and prevent further misconduct. 
Okay, so often here you'll see that there'll be a really, really high amount of money that is put onto a business to try to really get them where it hurts, get them in their pockets and um, punish them. You know, if you're a company that makes millions and millions of dollars, even a million dollar claim might not be, you know, a million dollars in damage, punitive damages really might not hit them where it hurts. But the idea here is that we're trying to. We want to punish them doing it in a financial way. And so you can get monetary relief both by making you whole again through compensatory damages and then, you know, three times that even in punitive damages. You know, you can get a large sum of money simply to punish the person who did the bad conduct and prevent them from doing it again. So we talked about a lot of high level concepts. I think it's important to have that foundation of what some of these terms mean. So I encourage you to take good notes here on this. We focus our discussion on, there we go, just trying to get this in the screen for you. We focus our discussion in this class on employment law, a lot of workplace rights issues that you should be familiar with from a human resource perspective. But you might not find yourself with contracts, even an employment contract starting a new job, or facing a claim for a wrong, a tort that might have happened. Uh, or even criminal charges someone you know or at a business level you might be facing. And so it's important to be familiar with this terminology. You know, something like intellectual property law, understanding you can't protect your ideas, understanding you can protect what they become and what exactly they mean. Okay, so I like to make sure you have that foundation on the language, but there's so, so much behind all of those concepts. So again, I encourage you to learn more about them in a business law course. Um, business law courses are often required for transfer. If you don't end up taking them as part of an associate's degree program, you will find yourself in any business program generally taking that class at some point towards your bachelor's degree. So let's bring this all together, taking a look at the VW emission scandal. VW had programmed its diesel cars to defeat emissions tests. So Generally, there were policies to make sure that the cars were not polluting the environment too much, and VW said, hey, let's program our diesel cars really to kind of game the system here. It turns out their cars emitted up to 14 times more nitrous oxide during normal circumstances than under the test conditions, which are very harmful for human health. About 500,000 vehicles were affected in the U.S., spanning the model years 2009 to 2016, but VW also makes sales worldwide, so there was an international impact as well. So consider some of their product reliability as a review here. How were they negligent? They had a duty to, to not harm the environment and to create a safe vehicle, which they broke when they gained the system the way they did, which did cause harm. It causes harm to human health and it causes harm to the people who own these vehicles, you know, because they were having faulty emissions tests. What type of strict liability applies here? Is this a manufacturing or defect or something else? Now, what has to be proven for them to be liable? Well, we have to prove that this was some kind of defect, certainly. You know, it wasn't doing a proper emissions test. You need to prove that the car wasn't altered. You know, so if you added some rims and made some changes to the engine of that car, you've altered it enough that they wouldn't be liable. Okay. Was there a breach of warranty, express or implied? Even if they didn't expressly state those terms, it's implied that this would be fit for this specific use, okay, and that it would meet these emission standards, a brand new VW car. And so by gaming the system in this way, they certainly were not. At a minimum, you know, the law is the floor. At a minimum level, they broke the law in many ways here, you know, in terms of negligence, strict liability, and even a breach of warranty for this product for the kind of gaming the system through their product, through their cars. It's also not okay on an ethical level, going back to our ethics concepts. You know, the law is what we must do. Ethics is what we should do. And here they certainly didn't do the right thing, polluting the environment in a way that was being regulated to help protect the community uh, and gaming the system in this way. It also hurt their competitors and, of course, their customers and their employees. If you're interested in learning more, you can find more information under the PowerPoint. You'll see lots of great resources to additional information about this emissions scandal. I hope you enjoyed learning more about our legal system. We saw a foundation of what the courts look like, where the law comes from, what it means. We saw different types of law you might run into. And again, you will see that in a business setting, 
you'll run into a lot of these types of issues. Conflicts happen, disputes arise, and so it's important to be familiar with the law. Hopefully this overview gave you a little bit of information to get you started, and I really encourage you to learn more regarding business law topics as you move further on in your career. We will focus in our course on employer and employee rights in the workplace to make sure you understand some of the employment regulations and what's fair in the workplace. But I encourage you to learn more about contract agreements, intellectual property law, tort law, criminal law, a lot of the things we've discussed today in a business law course, either here at Montgomery College or when you could transfer. Thank you for learning more about our legal system.